Hello once again everyone, I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1, my new book featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know. It's available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Graham Parker is a British rock singer and songwriter who is best known as the lead singer of the popular British band Graham Parker and the Rumor. Despite moderate commercial success, Parker has been hailed by critics as one of the most prominent musicians of his generation. With his witly heated, often class-conscious lyrics and energy-fueled music preceding the arrival punk rock and new wave music. Many fellow musicians such as Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, and Frank Black have expressed admiration towards his music. Parker has also played himself in the comedy This is 40, starring Paul Rudd, Leslie Mann, Megan Fox, Jason Segel, Albert Brooks, Melissa McCarthy, and John Lithgow. Please welcome singer, songwriter, musician, author, the legendary Graham Parker to Interviewing the Legends. Graham, let's talk about your uh, most recent release, Cloud Symbols. Cloud Symbols, yeah. Um, that seems like in the dark ages now before COVID hit, but it was uh, yeah. actually my most recent studio album. And since then, with that same band, The Gold Tops and The Rumor Brass, the, the uh, two of the original guys. Which I love. Yeah, we did a, a six-show uh, uh, live, live six shows of, of live in in the UK, and that was recorded. And we came up with this record, uh, Five Old Souls, and that's also come out on my label here, One Hundred Percent Records. So, um, so it's sort of uh, you know there were some oldies on that as well, but basically there was a lot of uh, Cloud Symbols work on that. So uh, yeah, I was I was I like Cloud Symbols a lot. It's uh, a very kind of seamless album to me that um, doesn't have a uh, it isn't one of those kitchen sink albums where right. a lot of disparate songs are thrown at the wall it's more like um, like almost a song cycle and the the, uh, the, the, the production is ex- it's seamless throughout and uh, I, I was pleased with that you know the next one may be very different I tend to go from those albums that I really want to make consistently seamless in the style and the feel of them. And that depends on the songs. You know, the songs I wrote for Cloud Symbols just came out that way. That They had a lot of swing, a lot of rootsy things exactly. that go back, you know, as part of my musical style, go back a long way. Well, it's very fun. All the tracks are, you know, most of them are very upbeat. Um, a Girl in Need, one of my favorite tracks. Um, to me, that would, you know, I was a top 40 DJ back in the late 70s. So I always pick which track would have been a top 40 hit. Girl, you probably one of those top 40 hits, I think. Yeah, back in the day when uh, radio didn't say, uh, okay, we know this guy's name. Um, no, he doesn't get played. He doesn't have hits, so we exactly. won't even try. Yeah. Uh, those days are gone, and the, you know, major record companies, of course, used to put in a bit of money and try to get you on radio, and they, yep. they spent, you know, promotional. And these days, it's um, you know, in indie land, it's it's not quite so. And uh, I am represented by a, a UK label, and mm-hmm. uh, my records tend to be, you know, they're sort of imports in America. Unfortunately, so I what I right. any record companies out there in the USA who want to do a deal with me, okay, I'm advertising here <laughs> on the USA so that they can get those records targeted to Sirius and, and uh, XM and all these things because there are a few yep. people who play me, but they're not hearing my records at all. They didn't yep. hear the one before. I was on Universal, for goodness sake, but... Uh, uh, it didn't. They they did nothing in America, whereas over here they did quite a lot. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, Cloud Symbols is the same thing. I'm on an indie label who distributes in America on uh, Orchard Records, and uh, as far as I know, they they're not doing anything to get them to radio, which is a yeah. great shame because, as you say, Girl in Need is is very catchy. But you know, very I'm not claiming originality. Most of us are in the same boat now. You know, there are. Yeah artists from my period who sold a lot more than me at the day and, and they're flatlining as well. Exactly. You know, that's, we're in the world of streaming and yeah. 
you know, everybody knows about Spotify rates and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, we are where we are, you know, just that's it. Get on with it. Make records, you know. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, if you don't play dance music, they're not promoted these days. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, Girl in Need is dance music, but um, yeah. uh, the dance music from the period you're talking right, about, when it right. wouldn't have had a chance of being a hit, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, like you said, there's a lot of these tracks that are kind of old-timey feel, which I, you know, uh, Ancient Pants, that's a good example. You know, what yeah. old-timey feeling. Love the, good. the trumpets, you know. I love the horns on these tracks, you know. Well, it was time to bring them back because I've done two reunion albums with The Rumor, and there wasn't a horn in sight, you know, and... Um, it's uh, it just a, and there could have been quite frankly on the second album on the um, on the album what was it called um, uh, mystery glue yeah. there's a few tracks where I should have got horns in but I didn't yeah. get that far and um, and and suddenly there I am doing an album after the reunion with the mm. rumor and I'm I'm sort of being contrary I'm sort I'm sort of going okay I'll I'll show them I'll stick them with horns now that I've finished with the rumor for a while. <laughs> That's funny. So you, you never know, maybe me and the rumor will be in our 80s and do the 40th anniversary reunion or something. Yeah, I'll get the yeah. whole section. We used them on one gig, the last gig we did in the UK mm -hmm. uh, of our, of our renew, renewal period, mm -hmm. and we, we got the horn section in, but uh, um, that, that was it. So it was, it was amazing to have horns because those songs on Cloud Symbols, as you can tell, screamed out for some horn parts. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the, your lyrics were fun as well. Very clever, you know. Um, Thank well, you. I was having fun. Yeah. Like, well, I love it when those drummers play the brushes. I love it when they stroke it with the pearl. <laughs> Turn the okay. sound of skylarks and thrushes, and I love to eat the oyster around the pearl. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love where you're coming from, man. You get this stuff. <laughs> Um, a lot of stuff these days is is playful, you know. I I, exactly. I did my time in the trenches with with the big ants and the heavy, you know. Don't ask me questions, right? right. And um, uh, protection, and you know th those kind of uh, what they used to call finger pointing style mm -hmm. songs uh, with a, with a lot of weight behind them, and um, you know that was that was that was then, and and uh, it, it doesn't sort of negate the fact that there might be some songs with a bit of meat on the bone in that respect right uh, god knows there's enough subjects of heavyweight um you know concept to sing about but i love having fun with words like that and mm -hmm. just the songs that are playful but um at the same time they got they got other things going for them but that that's really the most enjoyable music i i love that, that i can think of right now in my, in my old age as it were you know <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're old, I am too. <laughs> it's good to be old, you know? Okay, well, wiser, it, smarter. Yeah. Wiser and smarter. I don't like the creaky bit, though. You know, I was <laughs> yeah. I was just messing around with my TV aerial, which meant getting down on my knees. Oh, I, thought, I could get stuck here for a while. Uh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, I do that. Was, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't sit up for it. You know, it just doesn't work. I got five kids, and I have to sit on the floor with them. Um, yeah, no, sitting on the grass doesn't work for me anymore. Yeah. I need a, I need a team to lift me up. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I'm quite limber, really. I'm, yeah, you know, I've got, yeah. I'm pretty fit and all that, but it's just the, uh, yeah. it's sitting down. It's you know laying down. You can't lay down on the grass. You'll never get up without friends. <laughs> That's funny. You have these songs here. There's a pattern uh, to it, and when, when I say there's a pattern, it's like you being alone and. You mentioned some uh, places in those songs. Like, it, it, uh, is the sun out at or Paris, Rome, you know? Uh, you mentioned, uh, let's see, what, what was it? Another track you mentioned, another place. But it, they, they're kind of the theme of being alone. Uh, oh, yeah. About, is there any significance to those tracks? Uh, what well, there's, mean? yeah, they, well, the, the clown symbols thing is, is uh, that that particular song is the sun out anywhere. Right. Um, you know, somebody seemed reviewed it and seemed to think it had some deep meaning about modern communication. It's nothing like that at all. It's just <laughs> I, looked, I was looking at my phone one day, and and everywhere in the world seemed to have cloud symbols. 
Okay. Not just not just England. That's funny. And uh, and it was just a spur to write a song that that uh, had that. Is it you know? Is the sun out anywhere? Is it in Paris or Rome? That was it. That's a, that's enough to to get a song. And then what you have to do then is is pretend it's about a a, a lover or something. And exactly. where I you? you know it 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 just kind of kicks into that because otherwise you're just singing about phones. Right. You're singing about a mobile phone or 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 just clouds and rain, which I wasn't, you know, which that kicks it off. But then it, 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 to give it some depth, you need to to put someone, you know, uh, uh, something about I'm muddling through since you've been gone and all right. these kind of things, you know. Right. And uh, so that, that's 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 how these things work. I wouldn't take them too seriously, okay. you know, because <laughs> they're. they're, they're but on the other hand, you see, well, the way I look at songwriting now that is, is it, it's it's playing with words. And John Lennon said that once: just just yeah. playing with words, man. Exactly. I mean, a lot of the Beatles songs, you know, they look at it. They look at the poster, "The Benefit of Mr. Kite." Yeah. And took all those characters and wrote a song. He was playing with words. Right. And a lot of the emotional songs are the same. They have great effect on people, but for the artist. It's just this kind of you put these words together, and it can it clicks into something emotional that you weren't really trying to get to, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think that's I think you, you know taking songwriters a bit too seriously is probably a bit of a misnomer when it is playing with words and these yeah. lucky lucky accidents come out that are like wow that kind of you know when I hear the mixes back I go. I didn't realize I was singing about that. Right, right. I didn't realize it had that much kind of emotional weight. Yeah. All, all I thought of was, well, that makes me laugh. Yeah, you know, exactly. Th that, that amuses me. Yeah. Um, but th there is that stuff in there. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out, it comes out in these songs and it, it starts off from rather... A mundane thing sometimes, like a cell phone with uh, cloud symbols in every country you're looking at. What one of those examples every Saturday night? You're 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 in Spain on that one, but yep. every Saturday night has me hitting my pillow early early. Every Saturday night feels more like a Monday or maybe even Wednesday. Every Saturday night has me weeping like a weeping willow. Every Saturday night freaking like a Sunday without you. I'm just playing all words. <laughs> that, that's right. It's it's playing with words and uh, it's it really is it's 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 one of those things where I call it theme association, like word uh, association. You suddenly get this thing like every Saturday night and I'm that happen to be sitting on my own because going out on Saturday nights is like a zoo out there, you know, and I prefer yeah. to go prefer to go out and hang out with people in the week when it's quieter yeah. in the pub, you yeah. know, or whatever. And it just struck, it, it, that concept just hit. And from then on, you've got so many things that you can put into that song yeah. that have to do with that yeah. uh, and extrapolate that and say, OK, let's let's say I'm alone. All right. Make it a big thing. Like, oh, my God, she's left me. You know, yeah. uh, it's extrapolating on a, on a theme. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very interesting thing when it happens and you think, well, that was it, that was funny with the way my brain worked then mm -hmm. from one little idea every Saturday night and there I am alone on Saturday night I'm quite thankful that I'm alone but I turned it into an Armageddon of misery it's really cool yeah you know the author in you is coming out you know you yeah. wrote the short stories I know I know you're an author yeah. so am I it's coming out man you're right. going yeah yeah you, you know, see right more books You've done you know? it, yes. I've had some books published, and um, yeah. the the songs, uh, some of the cloud single songs, are a little bit like short stories, ancient they past. Yeah. It, it's like a description of someone who right. is still living. You know, it, it could be a, a little movie that of someone still living in their past when the aspidestra, mm -hmm. the aspidestra, the, the plant was a symbol of shabby genteel middle class. That song, mm -hmm. that that mention of aspidestra comes from George Orwell. Right. In his book, uh, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, oh. which is a book I read years ago. And yeah. it's, uh, the Aspidistra was a symbol that you're not working class, you're on the up and up. 
<laughs> and as he called it, the shabby genteel middle class. They always had aspervistras. Yeah. You know, and if you were in the working class like me, and, you, yeah. and your parents bought an aspervistra, uh -huh. you know, it was like, oh, a bit pretentious, aren't they? Oh, yeah, aspervistra. <laughs> Sitting there on the landing, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it is a short story, you know, in itself, that song. It is. You're very good at it. Two songs which to me are huge, okay? Bathtub Gin. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of like uh, a clever song by uh, like the Beatles, kind of like Yellow Submarine or Paul McCartney's Uncle like Album. It's got that type of, you know what I mean? Fun. Which like, song is that? Uh, I'm sorry, Ray, which song is that? There was a slight drop out there. Sure. Uh, Bathtub Gin. Oh, Bathtub Gin. Yes, yeah. Please, yeah. Well, yeah, um, there's a number of things there. A, a lot of it is to do with the, um, there's a couple of things, the Ken Burns documentary, Prohibition, right, about right. alcohol prohibition, 1920 to 33 in America. Yep. Um, what happens when you make a drug illegal, especially, a, you know, a popular drug like that, that, you, you know, is, is basically a neurotoxin. That's what alcohol is. It's ethanol. Mm -hmm. It kills you, yeah. you know, but if you're going to have a drug that dangerous, it's much better if it's legal um, because it's vetted. You know, it, there are certain procedures and certain government rules as to wh who it's sold to. Right. In other words, not minors. Uh, and and many, many other rules that come with it. Don't get in a car and drive it, all these kind of things. Yeah. Um, and if you don't do that, what happens is you will get bathtub gin. Mm -hmm. People will make it. Right. And it will be extremely dangerous, and they'll be selling it. Mm -hmm. Not only that, Al Capone will take over the business. Of the, <laughs> yeah. Basically, Al Capone was the take, took over the business of, of illegal drugs uh -huh. in in the in the in that period, uh, yeah. nineteen twenty to thirty three. So there's that going for it. The other thing is the war on drugs, which is a war on people, simply disguised as a war on drugs, mm -hmm. meaning the arbitrary list of illegal drugs. Right. You know, if you make much love drugs, drugs like cannabis or marijuana, as you call it in America, or MDMA, mm -hmm. drugs are in fact largely safer than alcohol. Oh, but they're not safer because they're illegal. They're more yeah. dangerous because they're illegal. Yeah. And so that concept is in the song. But you could put all that aside and, and say, I was just having fun with lyrics as well. Yeah. There, yeah. there is a background behind the song. And, um, you know, I was kind of including it in the, you know, the ships go out, the ships come in, then they start slinging that bathtub gin, <laughs> which is basically a bit like, um, you know, uh, adulterated heroin or, yeah. adulter you know, adulterated uh, cocaine, which most, co much of the street drugs are adulterated because they're illegal and yeah. because the people who own the business are the Al Capones of today. Exactly. And so that is all in the song, but it's, it's not, I'm not hitting you in the face with that. I'm boring you with that now. You know? <laughs> uh, okay, trying to get a message across here, but basically with the song, I'm having a great deal of fun and making yeah, it swing. Sure. You know, my, yeah. my grandfather on my dad's side did the bathroom liquor thing. They made a thing called a product, which is like a ouzo. In Ooh, the ouzo. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, ouzo. Yeah. Yes. And oh my God! I, I I had ouzo. I remember that in Greece, and uh, uh -huh. it was basically an. Or, I had auditory hallucinations. I mean, it was really. It's a it's a it's a very trippy kind of alcohol ouzo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness it's legal, you know. An illegal yeah. form of ouzo could be very very bad for you, and give you instant Parkinsonians symptoms. <laughs> like bathtub gin did that kind of thing. Exactly. Made you blind. Made yeah. you blind, made you crazy, and then killed you. You know, so I'd rather be getting a vet, you know, a, a legal bottle of alcohol, which because yeah. I know it probably won't kill me, not in one night. <laughs> <laughs> At least it'll take a lifetime, <laughs> which is good. Two more tracks uh, that finished the album. Wow, nothing from you. What a huge '50s kind of rock and roll girl on that one, huh? Nothing from you. Yeah, nothing from yeah. you. Fantastic song. Thank you, sir. Well, that's that's it. That's so rock and roll and so it swing. It's got so much swing going for it. Yeah. And uh, you know, a, a tricky little number with the turnarounds that uh, made the band, you know, work very hard and get to the, take their memory pills beforehand, <laughs> because it's got those funny little turnarounds which I love to do. And um, 
oh, there's a lot of fun lyrics in there. I'm strutting, uh, strutting like a peacock on the 20 foot wall. It's, you know, here's this guy. He's full of himself. He's uh-huh. got money. He's got everything. Yeah. But she doesn't fancy him still. Right. It doesn't matter to her. You know, what an unusual woman. All that money and success doesn't mean a thing. You know, it's one of those kind of sort of things. Why, why don't you like me? Look at me. I've got, a, I've got, I've got bitcoins and an e wallet, <laughs> and she still doesn't fancy me. And I'm strutting around like a pig or down the twenty foot wall. Thank you for picking that one out. That, that's a great deal of fun as well. I think. Yeah. I that's got to be great live. That tune's got to be great live. We haven't done that one live. We didn't yeah. do that. But so uh, if I do do some more with the Gold Tops one day, yep. um, you know, that that's one we missed out on. <clears throat> now here's the tune. Oh my gosh, this is this is a funny song, very true, and a little scary. What happens when her beauty fades? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit dodgy, that one. I, oh, yeah. I got I to read some lyrics on it. What happens when he creaks and groans? Is that the time to give up? Losing all kinds of bustles and drinking food from a cup? He used to, too. Now he stops. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's <funny>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for enjoying this stuff, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. uh, yeah, that one was a, a little bit on shaky ground. I felt a bit funny about that one because it's like, you know, it starts off with a woman. You know, what happens when her beauty fades? And, yeah. and as I went along, I said, well, I've got to bring in, I've got to make this equal here. Yeah. I've, got to, I've got to make this exactly. equal. And, uh, you know, uh, and then I, I get into, you know, it's what's inside is what's really right. important. I'm glad you put that in there. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I, I had to give myself saving grace there. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been just ugly. Lots and again, <laughs> what I thought about was, was swing and uh, that, that track swings and, and the the horn section part, you know, the horn section solo, it's it's a it's pure Van Morrison. Of course it is. I'm, I'm stealing away. You know, unashamedly there, that horn section solo bit is is just right out of the Van book. You're sounding a bit like Van Morrison on a couple of tracks, by the way. <laughs> well, from the, the you know, I really I kind of relate the record in some ways to Howling Wind with White Honey, right? You know, and and Lady Doctor. I mean, we're we're talking Van influence. And of course, Van influence was soul music and swing music and all right. these things. I was also influenced by as a kid. Yeah, it's just yeah. Van was the man who, who got to the beat everybody with the punches. The white, the white guy who right. could do this stuff. Exactly. And you know, we all, you know, so many people owe him a, a debt for, you know, just being the man who, who grabbed that and also had a lot of weight in a lot of his lyrics as well. He, you know, the guy's got it all, really. Yeah. But well, the last track on the album is Love Comes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you get a little bit more serious on this one, I guess. Well, yeah, that song has got a story behind it because that yeah. song started the album. Okay. The reason being is I was on tour, a duo tour in, in Britain with uh, Brinsley Schwartz, my mm-hmm. guitarist from the uh, room, and I did a number of duo tours with him. Right. And uh, there was about three or four days off, um, and I came back to the, to, to here in London, to my home here. Mm-hmm. And Judd Apatow had already um, uh, emailed me and said, "Have you got any songs, new songs for the TV shows I'm working on?" Right. One of those shows was called Crashing, which was on Netflix, I think, or in HBO, I think. Okay. And the other one was called um, Love. Mm-hmm. Which was on, um, uh, I think that was on one, one of them was on Netflix, one was right. on HBO. Okay. And I said to him, I emailed back, I said, No, I don't really have anything. And then, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you, yeah. which was a dumb thing to say, really, because you should you should go out of your way when yeah. John Apatow asks you if you've got any songs. <laughs> and I was like, eh, I don't think I've got anything much. And I went off on tour and then came back and 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 uh, I I thought of this I did the, it popped back in my head about Judd asking me and I thought well wait a minute this song looks pretty complete so I slammed it down on the iPhone and sent it to him and he said I love it how would you record it I said very simple with brushes four piece band you know three four piece add add keyboards uh, and simple and really pure uh, with a slight country bent to it country feel right. And um, I sent it to him, he said, I love it, let's do it. So I, I went into a studio, 
asked Martin Belmont, uh, right. the guitarist of the room, who I thought Martin would be perfect for this. Yep. I said, can you name me some mu musicians that would work, that could play this? And he came up with um, Simon on the bass, Roy on the drums, and then we got Geraint Watkins in, who's a well-known keyboard player, uh -huh. plays with all kinds of people. Yeah. And uh, went in and, and uh, recorded it, sent it to Judd, and, and voila, it ends up on this. Um, it ends up on actually ended up on the Love Show, I think. Um, uh, I've got the shows mixed up, but whatever. I, I think it was. I said, no, I know it. On the Love Show, it was um, on Judd's Love Show. It was uh, another song called um, uh, Dreaming, okay. which is on right. Cloud yeah. Symbols. So that came a bit later, but the first one... So once I'd, I'd recorded Love Comes, I thought that could be the linchpin for an entire album. Sure. I love the sound of it, and the, the second verse has a, what I, I sort of thought was a Patsy Cline, you know, by, by, via uh, Willie Nelson. Mm -hmm. she, uh, the, song, the lyric goes, uh, Walking through the streets at midnight give the world, gives the world a different hue. Everybody's got their color, make mine a shade of blue. That walking yes. through the streets at midnight reminded yes. me, I go out walking right. after midnight. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that is beautiful, man. I've linked that in without knowing it. Yeah. And so I wanted to get that kind of feel on the entire album to a right. certain extent. And that song was the one that had it that absolutely locked down, you know. And, uh, you know, so then I came up with the, the song Dreaming and sent that mm -hmm. to Judd. He said, great, we're going to use this in the, in, the, in the love show. So not only did those two songs fund the entire album, thank you very much to HBO and Netflix terms, you know, Definitely. better than Spotify, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's pretty much what we've got left, being on TV shows and yeah. adverts, you know, yeah. for, to make money. Yeah. So that, that was marvellous. It kick-started the album, and it inspired me to, to get on with the bits of songs and finish them, you know, work on them, come up with new ones. And every Saturday night was the last edition, really. Two albums before we were due to go in and do the second part of the album. Yeah. I wrote every Saturday night, and voila, the thing was complete. Well, I'm giving Cloud Symbols five stars, man. I love it. Thank you. Good up. Fun album, man. I wish you'd sell millions of copies. I'm going to promote the hell out of it on all my sites. So, Yeah. yeah. Next album will be on it. Yeah, good, 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 good. I want to mention Five Old Souls, the live album, which has a lot of the Cloud Symbol uh, tracks on there. But I think you said you were very, uh, very pleased with the live album, one of your favorite uh recordings right yeah um it's a couple of guys did that and they they've done some other stuff with me before recording yeah. stuff and they are very very good um and they do it for next to nothing i mean i i say can i give you some money basically yeah which is pretty good to be able to do that these days and they say well that's very generous of you you know they're not charging and um so you get you get this record out of it, and my my company over here, Hundred Percent Records, loved it, and we're all over it. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's the best sounding, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, yeah. it's, it's it's just got a, a, a it's, it really captures the band, and we were we happened to be on the last gig of a tour. My voice was in perfect shape. Mm -hmm. The tour had been set up very nice. It was six dates with just a day off in between, but it worked beautifully for the vocal. And we were in Southampton, which was a, it was actually a stand-up venue, which I don't usually do these days. Right. Uh, it also doubled as a roller park, I think, this venue. Oh. <laughs> there was a few strange things going on with this venue um, <laughs> in Southampton and on the coast of England. Uh, but man, that room sounded good. The crowd were just raving that night and, and, and standing up to boot. And uh, so it had that old feel to it. So yeah, I, I was pleased with that one. I want to hear you do Rockin' Hawk live. Oh, yes. Whoa. <laughs> That's what we did on the tour. Yeah, that was oh, Martin man. Belmont recorded that years ago, and it goes uh, way back before that. It's a 60s song, rather obscure. Great. Um, yeah. it's re it came out, I think, on an Alan Toussaint label or something. Right. And uh, I forget the name of the band. The, the, was it the, the Rockin' Hawks doing the song Rockin' Hawk? I don't know. I think it was Studio Guys or something. I'm not sure of the, the history of it. I looked mm -hmm. it up, but 
Um, that, that's Mar that's a Martin Belmont vehicle for guitar yeah. there, and playing rhythm on it, I, I just loved it. It was a cracking song, and the horn said, "Can we do something on that?" I was like, "Oh, of course, let's do yeah. it." You know. Uh, you also did. You've been busy squeezing out sparks. That's a solo uh, acoustic 40th anniversary album. That you yes. Did. So I wanted to mention that one as well. Well, yeah, um, it was Martin again. I yeah. think I was having an a, a Indian dinner with him because he lives okay. up the road in London. And okay. he, he said, you know, it's going to be 40 years next year. It's right. the anniversary of Squeezing Out Sparks. Wow. And, uh, you know, I had a few drinks and uh, <laughs> the Indian curry. My head was exploding uh -huh. with heat. And okay. I got too excited and said, I should do a, a, a tribute, a, yeah. like a solo record. Sure. And I went to a little studio that happens to be run by Simon Edwards, the bass player of the of the Gold Tops, the band I dubbed the Gold Tops. And um, I went into his studio and we recorded it in a, a couple of days. Took quite a lot of practice because um, some of the songs are tough, like Don't Get Excited is not exactly a solo tune. Right. But when you're in a studio, it's different from being live. You can relax a little more and, and settle yourself into it. And cut, you know, you cut out the solo because nobody mm -hmm. wants to hear an acoustic guitar playing, a, you know, what is it should be a lead guitar solo for right. 10 minutes, you know. Uh, and um, I, was, I was pleased with the results. Uh, you know, it was a, a, the mic technique. We had two, we had the acoustic guitar going through a small acoustic amplifier that I brought mm -hmm. along and a direct signal and a microphone and I sat in the booth and just played them live. Uh, one, one take, you know, if I messed it up, I'd stop and, you know, basically they're, they're just one take things, nothing sewn together, no additions. So uh, it was a nice thing to do for that mm -hmm. record, I thought. And, and oh, yeah. the tour I did after that in yep. the USA and the UK were basically very heavily uh, squeezing out sparks oriented the material it's it's good to do that i i you know it, it, it doesn't matter what new albums i've got out right i honor my past because a lot of the songs to me feel even better than they did in the original days because yeah. i reinvent them exactly especially with solo solo is what i think of as my most creative and open way of playing mm -hmm. the, the reinvention of the songs the opening up of the songs the mm -hmm. the, the fact that i can change tempos on different time signatures to suit me in the voice is a a marvelous thing actually i yeah. you know so it's um you, you know i always honor the past and do plenty of oldies on, on shows these days as well as new stuff i tell uh tom rush this i said there's nothing like a uh, a solo acoustic guitar player on stage with a story that's that's all you need <laughs> You don't need a big Tom, band. <laughs> yeah, I, Tom, Tom Rush, I believe, would know all about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of it, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's the storytelling thing, and it's it just brings people in in a great yeah. way, you know. And um, you know, band tours for a lot of us, we're priced out of it. You know, I, I, you know, all those times of bringing UK bands over. I mean, there's nothing more I'd love than to bring the episodes to America. Right, right. Uh, for one thing, though, you know, there's a thing called US visas, and they, mm -hmm. it's a scam, you know, financially. Right. Um, and it's just to do that is it just there's so many young bands cannot even do. I know. Well, I, I had the the privilege of being yeah. able to bring bands over. Yeah. I was, you know, I'd have four record albums in deals with major labels. And there was a lot of money. I had a lot of money in the 80s. Right. And, and through the 90s, I've been very blessed with all that. And I could do that. But now it's out yeah. of the question because... You know, an American act, for instance, pays their, their Asian pay 140 pounds, you know, to a couple of hundred bucks mm -hmm. to the American act to pick up a work permit on the border as they're coming through Heathrow Airport. Right. We, we have to pay five grand oh, for a, a visa in America. And of course, I have to pay that for the band members. Yeah. I, you know, and that kills it. The tour is dead there. And, uh, you know, we, I, we have it. You don't want to get political, but there we have this special relationship with America, but it's only ever gone one way, and our yeah. our government just will never challenge American rules on that because they don't mm -hmm. care about um, culture in Britain. They pretend they do, but they don't. Really? Is that but right? The Europeans, the Europeans care about culture. Yeah, you know, 
uh, America cares more about culture than Britain. We, we, we don't have anyone to say to us, America, can you be fair about this? Yeah. Can you let our musicians come there for a yeah. fee that they can afford? Exactly. But they, they, they you know, my, I've talked to my local politician and they say, we can't talk to America. They don't answer us. Yeah. They don't even get back to you. The, the Department of Homeland Security do not get back to us. That's how much respect they really have for the group. No, it's awful because the young bands, I mean, I have, I've had my day in the sun. It doesn't kill me that I can't bring a British band there. It's, it's yeah. a real shame. But young bands, there's this band Stone Foundation over here. Let me give them a plug. I've worked okay. with them a bit. They're fantastic, a soul band. Okay. They are it. They, they've got all their stuff together. Paul Weller plays with them and, and has produced their records. Really? And uh, yeah, it's Stone oh. Foundation, check them out. And okay. I, I appear on stage with them quite a lot. We do, they do tell you play house down with me. And uh, they can't go to America. They're on, a, they're on the indie label, same label as me here, or they were for a few records. I don't know, they still are. They can't take that amazing band like yeah. I did with a horn section with about six musicians to America because it's just not worth you can't go past go because of the visa costs yeah. and then you have to fly everyone yeah and it's all out of the question really and it's really a shame that that band could kill it on the club scene in in America they could be doing you know the city winery venues and actually right. the, the Americans would love it it would it would actually kill but we're pro we're pressed out of the thing and it's I a know, real it's shame a, really I, it is and they, they, you know they're a younger band than me but they're not kids yeah. But, you know, it's a shame. You played, I think you played, uh, is a Ram's Head in Annapolis, didn't you? Ram's yes, Head? I play, played that. That's my old, my old stomping grounds. That's where I was a top 40 DJ in Annapolis. Fantastic. Uh, but the Burt Spears and other Annapolis, uh, Ram's Head, those are cool venues. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do They're you all think good. Again? I know things are tough right now, but. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm nice. sure a lot of venues haven't come back from COVID. I mean, a few yeah. must have died a bit. Yeah. Um, I've got some dates coming up. I've got some dates coming up um, uh, in April and um, April and May, solo okay. dates in the USA. Oh, good. good and good. Um, if people want to know, go to grahamparker.net and, right. and look on the tour page. Or Twitter is my sort of go-to daily thing where you get the best right. jokes um uh yes and, <laughs> at, go to at, at it's graham parker right at it's graham parker i didn't okay. start the twitter account i took over it when i realized that whichever record company started it were yeah. uh, extremely lame there weren't enough jokes involved so i said let me take over this twitter thing okay right so that's at it's graham parker and you know i'll, I'll post um the um the, the the dates tour dates they're up on there already okay good and all that stuff yeah i just want to mention some of the greatest hits by graham parker some of my favorite tunes local girls which was huge um protection um uh, discovering japan another favorite tune stupefaction new york yeah. shuffle heat treatment so so many great tunes man um uh, Thank you so much. Ordinary word, you can't be too strong. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't mention this is 40. <laughs> oh, this is 40, yes, all right. Yeah, yeah, it happened. That was, I loved that movie. It was so fun. It was great. Well, how, how was that? Did, did you have fun doing that movie? Um, I had the greatest amount of fun yeah. uh, ever since, you know, it was it was as much... It was a it was a, a shocking and surprising and interest and and, um, and marvelous to me as when I signed my first record deal because it was like uh, I, suddenly I had a record deal and I was working as a gas station attendant at the time when I got a record deal uh -huh. uh, and, and doing cleaning houses in the afternoon, you know, in in the county of Surrey, uh, you know, not ex not really sort of expecting, you know believing I would get a record deal, but not knowing. And uh, I had no, no belief or knowledge that I would be in a, a Hollywood movie that would be number three box office in this first weekend and be all around cinemas in America for months afterwards and was in the top four in, you know, in, a, in a bunch of other countries. And, and every now and again, 
you know, there it is on British TV and American TV. It's still there, mm -hmm. um, you know, bringing in the a few pennies and the residuals. Yeah, it's, it's on Amazon. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's all it's great, and um, it was a, a huge amount of fun, and very challenging because every pop singer wants to be an actor. Right. Unfortunately, and every actor wants to be a pop singer, yeah. and and really, it's a bad idea. Whichever way you look at it, both are bad right. ideas. You know, right. stick with your job, pal. But of course, if <laughs> if you get a chance, if you get a chance, you go, oh yes, that's me. I am an actor. Of course, I am. Um, and so um, I was just like, you know, Judd, I'm your man. You know, and and by the way, I've I've reformed the rumor, which you didn't know about. Nobody knew about. Right. And, and I said, you should get them, them in your movie. And yeah. he did. And it was the, the most awesome beginning for us to start our our reunion period by everyone being flown first class to Hollywood, you know. <laughs> it was the rumor were like, what, are you kidding me? And I said, no, this is happening, boys. It really is. And um, it was it was just great fun. And Judd is one of those people, one of the few people, let me tell you this, in the industry who have put their money where their mouth is as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. i'll say that because i get so many people who, who do the movies the songs for movies direct not just directors music supervisors they meet me graham i'm a huge fan i love your work i love it going back to the, <laughs> the squeezing out the sparks i love your work graham i'm a huge huge fan and i say oh great okay thank you look at them well use one of my songs mm -hmm. why don't you i don't say that i just mm -hmm. look at them with thank you okay but john apatow says it and he does something about it right is the only you know he's the only one basically mm -hmm. Who's come through with a good? I mean, I can I can tell you the name of directors and, and you know they, no they don't they don't they don't pull the trigger on it but John did and the thing is he does it for tons of people. If you watch one of those shows like the show I was mentioning, Love, right on on, on HBO, the artists he used on there, yeah, and you don't know what it means to artists these days to get a payday on a show that's on a Netflix or an HBO, right. Because it wipes out a year's worth of nothing on Spotify. Right, right, right. You know, and it, yeah. it really is. The judge just supports music. He supports artists. And he, he did the same with um, Loudon Wainwright. Loudon Wainwright III. He did the same with him. Who He had a lot of music uh, involved in um, the, the predecessor to This Is Already Knocked Up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he actually wrote a whole soundtrack, uh, a whole bunch of songs. Yeah. And it was Judd who, who wanted him. And then one of his songs was also a beautiful song, was on um, uh, This Is 40. So he he's always like, you know, he, uh, Judd is in the position where he can run the show. And if he wants to get Graham Parker in a movie, he'll get, Graham, he'll get me in the movie. Yeah. And I, because I thought the Universal are bound to kick me out of this. Yeah. I thought they're bound to. They're going to say, why didn't you get somebody people have heard of? You know, why are you getting this loser, Graham Parker? <laughs> oh, and, <God. laughs> but it, it's got nothing. It had nothing to do with Universal. John yeah. does the movie and he rules. Yeah. And nobody questioned him. Graham Parker's in the movie. And uh, I thought that was uh, just a, a really big of him. Yeah. And I, I thought I was, and I thought it was, I was the right choice, quite frankly. I think so. Yeah, well, I'm glad, Grant. You look great, by the way. You, you, you know, uh, you, you look like you're 40 years old, in my opinion. I was a little worried about you when I saw you in that movie because you were talking about the gout. Doctor, part that that part. Well, I, I took the part to heart because when Judd, when I, I, I talked to him about it, he said, you know, that I would be the character who was basically destroying this new record company. And I said, uh, hello, I can do that. Yeah. And uh, yes, I will demean myself at every step. That's funny. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a blast. Man. Yeah. I loved it. Oh, by the way, the... Jewish newspaper guy over there loves the record. <laughs> David Wilde, you know that's David Wilde, the great writer David Wilde. Yeah, yeah, no, it's brilliant. So yeah, I love yes, it. it's a great, it's so funny. Thank great you, cast, too. Get a lot of good oh, Awesome, unbelievable cast. Yeah, I've got, I've got to ask you a couple of really cool things. You did you did a, uh, an acoustic version of Pink Floyd's "Comfortably Numb" and surprised me. That was cool. But you did a bunch of Lennon Martin songs that were 
least? How did that happen? Oh, uh, yeah, that was um, actually, let me see what happened with that. Oh, yes. Before that, I was mixed up with this guy who is um, part of the Jack Kerouac estate. Okay. Uh, this sounds strange, I know. Um, and it, I think it was his uncle was related to one of Kerouac's wives, and they managed to get the estate all a bit funny. Um, and I used to do some Kerouac readings, including a Viking Penguin double cassette reading okay. with the musician David Amram playing behind me as I read uh, synopses, uh, short versions of Kerouac stuff. So I was involved in that uh, Kerouac scene sometime in the 90s. And that same guy who was involved with that um, got involved with someone else who had a record company or something. And they came to me about these lost songs of the Beatles, songs that they wrote, but largely didn't record. You know, the, the, oh. the, the what is it, P Peter and David, and whatever they were called, the Usher, uh, Peter Usher and the, right. you know, that, those, that songs, I can't remember, Silla Black, mm -hmm. uh, and I did the Bad Fingers song, I believe, um, yep. If You Want It, Come and Get It, which was yep. written by McCartney. Right. Um, and uh, another song called Tip of My Tongue by somebody, was, I forget his name, but it was somebody I'd never heard of, never heard of the song. And I did a reggae version of that. Very interesting. And, and, huh. and uh, the, the great Bill Janowitz was on there. Right. Um, you know, from Buffalo Tom. And of course, the great uh, Kate Pearson from the B-52s. And all of the musicians were fantastic. And... Um, we just split the songs up between us and went into a studio and, and did them together. And it was, I thought it was a lovely little album. That the yeah. last songs of Lennon McCartney, I think it was called, wasn't it? From a window, from a okay. window. And that was a Billy J. Kramer song from a window that I did, and right. I'd never heard it before. I'd huh. never heard that song by Billy J. Kramer. I missed it entirely. Yeah. Uh, I saw you last night from a window. I was, yeah, it was Billy J. Kramer. Yeah. Yeah. I'd missed that entirely. So these, some of these songs are so new to me, and I, you know, of course it's written by Lennon McCartney and Beatles. So they, how, 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 you can't go wrong, really. I got to, I got to find that, and I'm going to promote that album as well because that's that's golden, man. That's yeah. If you can find it, that's fine. Yeah, man. Exactly. Grant, here's a question I ask everybody. I get some very interesting answers. Okay, if you had a feel the dreams wish like the movie to uh, perform or collaborate. Anyone from the past or present with it? Hang on, uh, you were breaking up a slight bit there. Any okay. any songwriter or new movie or what? Yeah, uh, if you had a wish, like the Field of Dreams movie, to uh, perform or collaborate with anyone Ooh. from the past or present, would that be a movie? Well, it, a wish. If you had a wish, like the movie, you you, you got to well, see like the movie, like the movie theater. Yeah, like right to collaborate. Collaborate. Uh, perform with anyone from the past or present? Well, uh, I'm, I'm really not much of a collaborative guy. I feel, like, you know, it's it's one of those things where I write half a song. You know, sometimes it's like with some people kind of, you want to write co-write songs. It's it's sort of sometimes kind of shyly mentioned to me. Right. And I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe. And I don't really mean it at all, you know, because if I write, every time I write, I get through half a song and I think, now, why would I want to Collaborate. Who's nobody's this good? You know, go away, <laughs> all of you. Uh, so, <laughs> and, uh, so yes, I'd, I'd rather up my own. You know what? I'd rather big headed, because I hear it and I think I, I can't share this with people. Yeah, I cannot do it. You know. Um, so it's very, it's 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 very difficult for me to nail that down. There was a time when I lived, I was in Manhattan, living mm -hmm. in Manhattan, and, and, with, and still have this place here in London. But I was here, right. I was there a lot, a lot of times on 18th Street. And my manager um, happened to manage um, Jeff Beck at the time, actually, and he he was somebody who was you know in that level of things, a bit in the know about all this and that, and I. And, and for some reason, I said, you know, uh, Keith was, I think Keith Richards was meant to be writing songs, and I think it probably turned out to be the expensive winos record in the end. <laughs> so I said to my manager, get hold of Keith Richards. Mm -hmm. Okay, get hold of Keith, tell mm -hmm. him I'll write songs with him. And he said he got hold of uh, his people. 
And I said, okay, well, nothing will happen, you know, but... And it's a funny thing, but every now and again, my phone rang at three in the morning. Right. Out of the blue. In New York. Now, this was the days when, you know, there was no internet. And nobody yeah. called you at three in the morning. Right. And I thought... And I'd hear it ring and ignore it, and there'd be no message. And I and I always said to my wife at the time, I said, she, she said, I bet that's Keith. And I thought, yeah, I bet it is. Does he really think I'm going to be up at three in the morning just to write songs with him, just to talk with him? No, I'm sorry, mate. If that's you, Keith. <laughs> that's funny. So I thought, I'd really, no, I'd rather be asleep at three in the morning. I don't yeah. care who's calling me, whether it's Keith or Mick. Uh, so but it, it could have been anyone. But I, I do like to imagine that Keith was up, as is yeah. usual, you know, night owl, just probably making a shepherd's pie. Yeah. You know, as he is known to do at three in the morning, you know, suddenly decide he's hungry. And, uh, you know, but... That was the only time, and I wouldn't have wanted to write uh, the lyrics. Mm. I would have wanted to write the riffs. Really? Because I can, I can do brown sugar all day long, pal. Yeah. Listen to Soul Shoes. Hello. Yeah. You know, what was I doing on Soul Shoes? My take on brown sugar. So I would have, I would have said to him, no, Keith, you come up with the lyrics. I'll, do, I'll do the funky <laughs> chords, mate. I'm better than you at that. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, it would have been, it would have been interesting. But um, that's the only time that I thought, well, oh. that, I, that I would go for, right. despite the fact that it would be a giant headache, because I'm a guy who likes things to run like a Swiss clock. Mm -hmm. I want tours. I want albums. I want right. like, everything to run like a Swiss clock. Sure. So it would be extremely difficult to work with anyone from the Rolling Stones. Yeah. You know, I'd probably give up after five minutes and say, I don't care what this is worth. Sorry, pal. I can't be doing this, you know. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, I'd be an awkward one to write songs with. There was also the period when publishing companies were saying, go to Nashville and in, in a day you write with three different people. Sure. And a lot of singer songwriters did that. Yeah. And I was like, nah. No, huh? Nah. Can't do it. No, I yeah. just I can't can't stomach it. So it's, it's, <laughs> there is no real dream or wishful no thinking. Dream. There's no field of dreams yeah. really here. I I don't say I don't say never any anything ever. They never say never. But right. basically, I'm not looking for it. and I don't have any dreams about it. So long okay. way long way around to ask your question. Lou Reed would have said no. <laughs> he would have. <laughs> yeah. Not much of an interview, really. Yeah. He, he was just pitched himself. That's the very Yeah. <laughs> Grant, any advice back from Luke or. Uh... Sorry, we're getting this um, thing where, where we started. For the viewers, sorry, I'm old fashioned. I'm on Skype and occasionally it's breaking up. Okay. So try that again, if you would. Anything else you need to promote? No, the, the tour in the USA starting okay. uh, in, uh, I think it's now starting in uh, in uh, April, maybe the last week in April in uh, stage one, Fairfield, Connecticut. Right. Um, as I say, go to grahamparker.net, hit the tour okay. page, go to at it's Graham Parker on Twitter, and you can find the stuff out and um, various other places I'm sure will be doing this. So there, it, it's what's right in front of me right now is that. However, on the last little tour I did last year in America, it, which happened in October, November, solo tour, I managed to do a tour despite the restrictions in 2021 COVID. I was doing two brand new songs. Mm -hmm. Songs that were started in um, lockdown. Uh, I started writing them in the first lockdown in 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say there might be something in the pipeline re regarding those two songs. Okay. So follow me on, on Twitter and, and the grahamparker.net. Okay. And you will see instant news if and uh, you know when that is is coming there might be something in the pipeline two songs brand new uh not really brand new because i started them some while back but brand yep. new to read to the recording world and keep your eyes open for those one of them yeah. i will i will tell you is called humans are the mutant virus oh i love it <laughs> it is deeply deeply yeah. offensive deeply really offensive. yes <laughs> wow 
And the greatest play on words, of, as usual, the greatest oh, amount man. of fun at the same time. So I'd say okay. there might be something, I'm just, I'm not confirming, but something in the pipeline here. Awesome. Hopefully, before I get out on tour this April and May in the Good. United States of America. I want to remind everybody to buy Cloud Symbols. Cloud Symbols is available at Amazon.com. Also, Five Old Souls, the live album by Graham Parker, also available. Squeezing Out Sparks, the solo acoustic 40th anniversary by Graham Parker, also available at Amazon.com. And also, of course, another prayer, 40th anniversary edition, all at Amazon.com. We used to buy all these at a record store, remember? What happened? <laughs> There's a few, man. There's still a few. <laughs> Don't forget Amoeba. Amoeba is still going in Los Angeles as well. There's, there's a big one there, isn't it? And exactly. Yeah, we got right. about one left in London. Maybe one, HMV oh, or something. Is that right? There's still one left? Oh, my God. Yeah, there are some small ones. So there are a lot of indie, indie ones that are yeah. really specialize in vinyl. Yeah. And uh, support those. Record Store Day is coming up. And, in yeah. fact, Five Old Souls will be available in the United oh, Kingdom, good. at least, uh, and, and purple vinyl. Good, good. And uh, they will be, you know, imports in, in America, so it will cost a bit, I'm afraid. But right. Uh, right. hopefully I'll get that sorted out in the future and then get some, you know, representation that actually yeah. makes the vinyl in America. Right. Um, so, you know, but uh, at the moment, that's where we are with uh, with that. So there's the, the vinyl stores mm -hmm. and the vinyl sales thing. You know, put your money there if you enjoy vinyl and have a good stereo yep. or a bad stereo. It's exactly. a good thing. I yeah. want to say also special thanks to Louisa Corman and Rob Acosta of the yep. Roots Agency for arranging this interview with Graham Parker. Graham, please come to Florida. <laughs> I'd love to. You know, I mean, I... I you know, it's one of those things that, as, you know, I've, I've put a whole blog on my uh, website about why I don't play in certain places, and it yeah. has nothing to do with my choice. It is simply that this is a business, right. and if they're, they're not playing, pay, you know, they're not demanding Graham Park at the venues, and if they don't pay, you know, I, mm -hmm. I have a reputation, and, and it's like I, I, I don't do this for fun. Mm -hmm. Fun is the end result. Yeah. Yeah, the, you know, I've done a lot of this. Right. Let's just say that since 1975, yeah. uh, playing live, I'm talking about. And, um, you know, it's I'm not that popular in Florida and never have been. And I've I've played there a few times over the years. But right. um, oh. it's it's about it's about the amount of popularity and that the venue really wants you. And, and there's a lot of promoters in places where I'm not popular who stick their neck out and they lose money sometimes. And I don't like losing anybody money. Right. You know, right. and it, it's, it's, it, it comes down to not, why don't you come to Florida? I, I'm sorry. I would love to. Yeah. I'd love to. There's a lot of places I'd love to, to play in America to widen the scope. And I've done them over the years. Yeah. But the ones that stick with you are the ones where there are an audience yeah. that will not make the venue lose money. Right. It's all about that. It's a business. And uh, uh, hopefully in the future, man, hopefully, I really do. I love you it. Know. You're a great artist. We love you, man. You look fantastic. You know, I'm glad you don't look like the movie. This is 40. There's a worry there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look like a movie. I'm just not acting like the movie. You're just not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Graham, for being on the show. I'm yeah. glad we're able to get through these. <laughs> and then pick up. <laughs> I hope it's all recorded for you after I all this. I hope so, too. It, it says it's recorded, so I hope you were okay. <laughs> if not, we'll, I'll go around to someone's house who successfully doesn't have an iPad that's out of date, who okay. has got Zoom. If not, we'll do it all again, man. It's a good, it's a good right. thing to do. It's cool. It's cool. But let's I'll, hope it's there. I'll send the links to your PR people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You'll get I'll get a link and I will plug it, man. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Me too, man. Fun. <laughs> bye bye. Be Thank you.